Hello and welcome to my garden. And to the two dresses that I'm going to be restoring to their former glory today, both wounded birds from the Second World War era. Uh, this is a late 30s dress. Uh, you can see it has some black bands that I would imagine were added because there wasn't quite enough fabric to make the dress. And this very different dress from the early 40s, which would have been purchased with coupons or a combination of coupons and money, and which you can see is missing its belt, and it also has a number of other issues. So by 1942, the coupon system for clothes was no longer enough. No point giving out coupons for clothes when the clothes just weren't there uh, and the fabric just wasn't there. So at this point, Border Tray thought again and they introduced the make and make do to avoid buying new campaign, which encouraged women to mend their own clothes. And this was initially greeted with resentment because women had already been uh, mending their own clothes for years before they were told to do it. And as we know, being told to do what you're already doing is kind of annoying. And it's especially annoying, <laughs> probably, if you're told to do it by men who aren't doing any mending themselves. So the make and make do to avoid buying new was initially gre greeted with <laughs> hostility and to the extent that it actually kind of reached the ears of men in government, uh, probably from their wives, but they, they kind of rebranded and they came up with the Make Do and Mend campaign, hugely better title, and they had two <laughs> big uh, promoters forces on their side. And the first was their very own, wait for it, puppet, uh, Mrs. So-and-so who was <laughs> always cheery in the face of mending and had lots of uh, useful advice to give. I did read somewhere that this was Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, but that was wishful thinking. It was Mrs. So-and-so doing the mending. And uh, Mrs. So-and-so <laughs> proliferated everywhere in publicity of the time and in magazines her cheerful face giving you advice and to be fair on board of trade mr so and so her advice is actually really useful and it was really thorough it covered everything from dealing with moths to looking after rayon washing darning all kinds of mending mrs so and so was full of useful advice and the second great promoter of the make do and mend campaign was British Vogue. If you haven't read the biography of Audrey Withers, the fabulous editor of that time, I highly recommend it. It's fascinating, amazing woman. And she really got behind the idea of make do and mending in fashion of that era. For example, if you were buying a garment, it would need to be nothing frivolous. They recommended a grey flannel pinafore dress that you could kind of dress up with accessories. But they also recommended repurposing uh, anything around your home to make new garments. And of course, quoted the wonderful Scarlett O'Hara, making her curtains into that uh, fabulous dress. Uh, lace curtains, could be refashioned into ladies' underwear. Hats could be made from all kinds of things and French magazines of the era are fabulous sources of ingenious ways to make anything around the house, Christmas decorations, into a wonderful new hat. It became like a kind of <laughs> badge of honour to make do and mend and all kinds of advice in the make do and mend leaflet for example of using colourful patches to mend and decorate uh, your clothes. 
anything that wore out might be cut up and repurposed to make something else so the armpit area as we'll see in one of my dresses the armpit area often disintegrates but if it's a nice thing you might cut out the front and put ties around the back and make it into a little bestie uh, which actually I have seen in uh, designers today doing this because they are strangely useful you can wear more hard wearing washable fabric the kind of blouse underneath like we were talking about with the tennis whites that could be boil washed anything that you're wearing that's under your arm area likely to disintegrate faster so with your little vestie you could have a kind of nice front in a less washable uh, more luxurious fabric uh, winter blankets could be cut up and made into suits some <laughs> wonderful advice in the make do and mend leaflets which makes me smile for children of the era because it's things like you can cut the trouser legs off men's grey flannel trousers and make knickers for children <laughs> lucky things and if that wasn't enough for them you could also cut the legs off pajamas and make them into little vests for your children so they were entirely kitted out in underwear from pajamas and men's trousers and in fact men's clothes became quite a source of fabric because while they were wet away and uh, women were needing clothes of course their eyes minds turned to what was in their men's wardrobes, brothers, husbands, that they weren't using at the moment anyway. And in fact, there were companies that did really well, like tempting women with offers like, oh, that <laughs> tweed suit of your husband's could make a really nice pinafore dress. Uh, home sewers were doing the same and, and actually especially popular were men's pyjama tops because they were colourful so they could be repurposed to make yourself a nice little summer jacket or a colourful blouse to go under your pinafore dress and there are stories of women greeting men as they came back from leave like basically <laughs> wearing the what had been the men's clothes kind of cut up and restitched to make fashionable women's clothes and men not noticing to be fair <laughs> they were probably not suspecting the nation did start to look a little eccentric with these ingenious ways of repurposing clothing you know colorful patches <laughs> reworked pajama tops hats made from christmas decorations and my <laughs> my favorite stories comes out of the women's institute actually thinking oh dog hair maybe dog hair could be spun and sorry and maybe dog <laughs> maybe dog i would do well maybe dog hair could be spun and made into <laughs> lovely <laughs> new dog hair cards um anyway i don't think that on terribly well they, they did they experimented with it uh, and they basically <laughs> found that it wasn't quite as good as cheeks wool dog hair don't think of it just as a nuisance <laughs> it can be very useful it's another now when animals kind of lovely story from the war years with backtracking a bit so parachutes made of silk so this is why silk was requisitioned during the war and full silk rayon became such a, a thing and this was now very comfortable and collectible in early 40s dresses so silk was made into parachutes although midway through the war they kind of realized that actually nylon is uh, more robust uh, silk continued to be used and if you were a machinist in a parachute factory and you were working on a nice big parachute that had like there was something a bit wrong with that panel of silk you could get to take it home so that was really popular and apparently this is where i'm going back to the well animals birds parachutes were made in all sizes because lots of parachutes were made for the 200,000 pigeons that were parachuted over enemy lines and in fact <laughs> sorry, gets me. and in fact 
in a sort of emotional way. And in fact, these pigeons did wonderful war work to the extent that 32 of those guys and girls, these little feathery guys and girls, received medals for their courage. So, how did I get onto pigeons? So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to get on to showing you the issues with my dresses and following the wonderful advice from it, which was really popular. So here is the good sleeve and you can see the lovely pleats um, that go into the cuff and help to form that lovely puff shape. And here is the sleeve for the issue. You can see it has a large hole and there isn't enough fabric on the dress to patch it. So I bought this top from a charity shop or thrift store for the rosettes. Well, I don't really like the diamantes, but I'll cover them with a button. And I thought I could use the fabric of this top to cut out a patch to go over the whole of the dress. So I'm just measuring the size of the patch and cutting out a slightly too large rectangle that I'm putting over the patch that I can then cut to down to the right size. And then I'll finish the edges of the patch and turn under the edges of the uh, whole of the dress as you can see I'm doing here and then sew the patch um, I did little whip stitches around the edge to uh, secure the patch um, which I forgot to film um, so onto the tear in the back of the dress and the make, do and mend instructions advise putting a piece of paper over the patch while you stitch the uh, edges together to secure it. But uh, I decided to use a little strip of fusible interfacing, which they didn't have in the 40s. It wasn't available to sewers until the 1960s. So I'm just securing that to the edge and then you um, do these little buttonhole stitches. I've just put up the little illustration there from the Make Do and Mend booklet. You do these little buttonhole stitches all along the edge and then you just stitch them together across the centre. And now I'm on to my uh, next dress which is made of a kind of brushed cotton and you can see it's really frayed away at the lapels actually on both sides so I'm looking to see where I can scrounge some fabric to patch those lapels and I'm looking with interest at the corners of the hem which feel quite bulky especially on this side so it would actually be improved by having some of that fabric cut away to patch the lapels. And then the other issue I have with the dress is that it's missing some of its buttons. I decided on the yellow buttons and my mother wove this wonderful stripy belt on her inkle loom to go with the dress too. As like many vintage dresses, it was missing the belt. And then out into the garden to stitch on the buttons. And um, here I am just undoing with the unpicker um, the um, hem of the dress to get to that little bit of extra fabric. Cutting that patch away. and then measuring to see that it fits over the lay porch it did exactly. Turning the hem back and making sure that corner is pressed out before re-hemming it. 
I turned under the edges of the patch and went out to hand sew it down. And of course, I had the company of my dogs. So just pulling on my vintage gloves to give my lovely mended 30s dress a twirl in the garden. I'm wearing a 30s cage hat with lovely velvet millinery flowers and I'm about to show you how my underarms, you would just never know there'd been a problem. And here I come in my other cotton dress with my new belt. Look at the labels, would you ever know? And I think the yellow flower buttons work really well with the floral prints, which has the yellow flowers and the design and the lovely belt my mum made. So thank you so much for coming along with me on my make do and mend adventure. I'm, I'm here with Treacle whose hair I haven't spun to make myself a nice new uh, cardigan or jacket although I have clipped him and spread his hair around my hostas because it's an excellent uh, slug repellent. I want to share with you too my passion for 1930s and 40s dresses. They are treasures and because clothes and fabric were so precious then, these dresses were really well loved. You can see how they've been <laughs> mended and sometimes altered <laughs> as people's size increased or decreased and you, you see the the different stitches previous owners you know some some people's are like big messy stitches and they just want to get it done and then other people have these kind of tiny careful little stitches and it it gives you such a sense of connection to their previous owners who who loved these dresses too and it's wonderful to maintain them and keep them so that they'll last in the future too so thank you very much for watching please subscribe and i upload every friday afternoon and i look forward to seeing you next week <laughs> bye and uh, Bye from Treacle too. <laughs> Bye.